Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alexa Barnett, and I am an intern at the Mental Health Foundation Australia, and I'm your host for today's webinar. We begin by acknowledging the Wurundji Wu Wurrung as the traditional custodians of the land on which our office stands and pay our respects to their elders past and present. We extend our respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people tuning in today. On behalf of the Mental Health Foundation Australia and the CEO, Mr. Basan Surini Basan, I would like to welcome and thank each of you for attending today's Lunch and Learn educational webinar on youth multicultural mental health, presented by Jim Gooden, Vice Chairperson of the Mental Health Foundation Australia. I would also like to welcome and thank the founder of Dr. MGR Educational and Research Institute, Mr. Thiru Shunmugam, Mr. Arun Kumar, and Dr. Amuda Kumar, for collaborating with the MHFA on this webinar. Dr. MGR Educational and Research Institute provides for contemporary knowledge, delivery of global standards, excellent in knowledge creation in emerging areas and mutually rewarding university societal interaction. Their mission is to make the institution as a resource center for higher level teaching, learning process in the field of engineering, dental surgery, medicine, allied health, sciences, humanities and science, architecture, and management and education. Dr. NGR Educational and Research Institute team which is to promote ethical values and encourage creative ideas among the younger generation, and thereby to develop their entrepreneurial skills, which will ultimately benefit the society and nation. They believe our students are to be the job creators, not job seekers. Before we begin, a disclaimer that this webinar is intended for educational purposes only and should not be relied on as a personal advice. Always seek the guidance of your doctor, psychologist, or other qualified health professionals regarding your physical and or mental health. I would now like to introduce our presenter, Jim Gooden. Jim is a former vice principal with 30 years experience in regular secondary and special needs schools. Currently, he is the vice chairperson of the Mental Health Foundation Australia and co-chair of the Victorian Mental Health Month Advisory Committee. Jim is also a committee member of many other boards and committees, including the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Psychiatrists, Chislam Institute Course Advisory Committee, and the Melbourne Bipolar Network. Jim was also the former vice president of the Australian National Association for Mental Health and former president and secretary, secretary for the OCD Foundation, now ARCVIC. Jim's knowledge on mental illness comes from professional, voluntary, and family experience. I would now like to welcome Jim for his presentation. Thank you. Can I be seen now? I can? All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, very pleased to be able to give this presentation to uh, you today, to the students of MGR University Chennai. I hope you are able to enjoy a nice lunch while I talk to you, courtesy of the Mental Health Foundation Australia. Uh, now I'll have to work my way through this. Next slide. Okay. Uh, what is a mental disorder? I think we, we should uh, get our definitions correct before we, uh, before we we go through anything else. It's always important to clarify your definition or uh, understanding before you discuss any topic. And the best definitional understanding really comes from the World Health Organization. It's the most commonly understood uh, definition. A mental disorder is characterized by clinically significant disturbances in an individual's cognition, emotional regulation, or behavior. Let me just explain that a little bit more. Cognitions are the way and the style of our thinking. Whether we are outgoing people, uh, whether we find social interactions stressful or not, um, our emotional regulation is about fluctuations in moods, our stability in terms of ups and downs, our unflappability, if you like. Are we easily irritated? Uh, by, by things in life. When things interfere with our pleasure in life, 
or our productivity and what we aspire to achieve in our lives, to a large extent, this is called a mental disorder. So that's a distress or impairment in important areas of our functioning that means we're not achieving the things in our life that we would like to achieve. Now, I've listed what I call the seven deadly fears. Uh, because fear is a very profound feeling that all humans experience and a very primitive feeling that enables our survival in the world to a certain extent. I believe that most of our major fears in life, uh, our, in our lives will fall under one, of, one or more of these headings. And I'll just go through them. The fear of being alone. For many people, we dread uh, reaching out finding that there's no one there to respond to our needs. So we need our families, our friends, our mentors to overcome this loneliness. And this is innate and inherent for all human beings. That we need companionship. We need a society to be part of. A community is tremendously important for all human beings. The fear of being without this is an overwhelming fear for many, many people. For other people, they have a fear of, uh, of connecting and in fact, of being part of those communities. So you've got two contradictory fears. Um, that fear is also a fear of being our true selves without, without, without a mask, if you want to say that, um, of exposing ourselves, uh, exposing our weaknesses, exposing the truths about ourselves. The third fear, fear of being abandoned that we are inadequate in some way, that we won't measure up, uh, that we are inadequate people in some respect. Then there's the fear that some people have of self-assertion. Some people are in fact overly agreeable to the extent that they will forsake their own uh, interests and uh, be too giving of themselves and can well be taken advantage of. Of course, there's the other extreme on that spectrum, which is being disagreeable. And there are people that are extremely disagreeable too. But those people don't necessarily have a fear of being disagreeable. But some people do have a fear born of their fragility of being overly agreeable. Then there's fear of lack of recognition not being appreciated for yourself, who you are, what your talents are. Fear of failure and success, which I'm sure a lot of students experience. How they're perceived by others. This is very prevalent, particularly during your adolescent years, those important formative years between 15 and, say, 24. And finally, the fear of being fully alive, the fear of of taking a difficult path, of, a, of wanting to avoid risk, of taking an easy path. That's also a fear that some people have. So some people don't achieve their greatest potential because they're fearful of actually throwing themselves into a task uh, because they feel that they might not be adequate to that, to that task. So they're what I call the seven the seven deadly fears. Uh, and they're pretty basic to, to all human beings. And you'll see where they come into my uh, further discussions about stress and anxiety, particularly later. Now, humans have always been acutely aware of fear. Fear, of course, is a positive thing. It can keep us alive, but negatively, it interferes with, with our lives. The major religious and spiritual traditions have always been concerned with our fears and have attempted to reassure us in our daily lives. For example, the Holy Quran says that we must take steps to help us overcome our fears. It encourages us to face our fears and our challenges, which is very good psychological advice to try to overcome and face your fears. The Holy Bible. Christianity says that worries and anxieties in the heart weigh one down. And that's a, a very good definition 
of fear, anxiety, and ultimately depression, that sense of weight and being weighed down, of not being able to get on with your life and enjoy your life. And in the Hindu tradition, um, we have Lord, and I hope I get this right, Dan Van Tri, who is the God of removing all fears. The fears that keep us from enjoying life and living in the sunlight of the spirit. So the traditions, religious traditions, stress uh, fear and in overcoming fear. Now, the modern Western attitude is to adopt a scientific methodology to our fears, which have manifested themselves or do manifest themselves as mental disorders. The removing of all fears is actually very consistent with the Western definition of good mental health. Now, there are two texts that we use in the Western scientific tradition, really. It's also the Eastern scientific tradition because it's accepted worldwide, these texts. The first one, probably the most important universally used one, is the DSM-5-TR. That's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And the Western concept has enumerated 297 specific disorders in the DSM-5-TR. Now, we won't be able to deal with 297 different disorders today, but you'll, you'll deal with the major ones and what they are and what they mean. There's also another instrument uh, that we use called the ICD. 11 now, I know there's a picture there says ICTD10, which is the International Classification of Disorders, but we're actually now up to ICD11. The DSM-5TR really comes out of America and the ICD10 or 11 uh, out, of, out of Europe. So why should you be you know, concerned about, uh, about mental health? Uh, what's the status of you people listening to this, what's the status of, of Indian students? Well, clearly, from what you're seeing on this screen, it's not optimal. The world mental health movement tries to minimise as much as possible the personal sources of suffering in the world. We will always have tragedy in life. Life will always be harsh and tough for many people because of circumstances beyond their control but we can try to reduce the pain that we inflict upon ourselves through habits of good thinking, good co cognition styles, and making sure that we don't uh, self-induce chemical changes in our brain that are detrimental to our cognitions and our way of thinking. And by that, I mean by substance abuse, alcohol, and other drugs, et cetera, that, that can be used. Now, from this slide, you'll see that many Indian students estimated, according to the Indian Council for Medical Research, their studies indicate that 12 to 13 percent of students in India suffer from some sort of psychological and emotional or behavioural condition. And that many of these conditions, in fact, go undiagnosed and that health seeking behaviour is inhibited, primarily because of stigma or lack of proper information, and I'll go into that in more depth later on in my discussion, issues that I think specifically affect Indian students in their uh, lack of willingness sometimes to seek advice and help for their issues. And of course, unfortunately, a worldwide phenomena is the uh, phenomena of suicide. Um, the most common and the, really the only uh, clear link between, in, in terms of causality between suicide, uh, cause of suicide is depression, depressive illness. And that's common to all suicides. And as you can see from the slide, death by suicide is the third leading cause of death among young adults and is a significant problem among college students in India as it is worldwide. Now, what do we need to know about mental health? Well, 
Let's start with fear first of all. As I said earlier, fear is a natural part of life and survival. It enables us to survive. We have what's called a fight or flight mechanism. That's really part of a very early, early mechanism in our brain. Think of our brain as being like a house that over millions of years, millennia, uh, we've added additions, bits and pieces. Well, some of those additions really are redundant in the modern world. Uh, most of us don't need to be fearful of saber-toothed tigers nowadays, but we might be fearful of speaking in public. We might be fearful of heights. We might be, we might be fearful of um, uh, flying, for example. Or in one talk I was giving, uh, I was talking about phobias and fears, and a moth flew into the classroom. And I literally had a girl, a student, dive under the desk in a, in a total panic because, unbeknownst to me, of course, and anyone else in that room, she had a moth phobia. Now, the timing was perfect to illustrate uh, that one can become fearful or phobic about just about anything in life. How does that happen? Well we have these fear triggers. The fear triggers, as I've said, the seven, seven fears can create stress. And this is caused chemically by a gland, the adrenal gland, uh, that produces two fear hormones, adrenaline and cortisol. These hormones are carried in the bloodstream to all parts of your body. Fear hormones are secreted by the adrenal glands, an endocrine gland, gland rather, located on the top of your kidneys also. The best way of describing it is that they carve fear pathways in your brain. You learn from repeated experience. All of us learn from repeated experience. But if that repeated experience is bad and your brain remembers that experience at some level, then that's not a good thing for your mental health, for your survival. The opposite applies. If you have good habits, good ways of thinking, good ways of approaching the world, then those patterns, those tracks, if you want to call them that, will become ingrained in your brain and they will tend to stick too. So we want you to learn good habits of thinking, good ways of cognition, good ways of thinking that help you in your future lives and careers. Now, just to give you some example of some of these fears and phobias uh, that we, when we talk about uh, in a clinical sense, um, uh, fears can grow into, into diagnosable mental disorders and uh, just as I mentioned earlier on the, uh, what, 273 diagnosable conditions in DSM-5-TR, one of which is glassophobia, or fear of public speaking. It's a very common phobia, and most of you, or many of you that I'm talking to now, will understand exactly uh, what this is and may have signs of this in, uh, in your studies. And it's something that you really don't want to get a grip on yourself. Uh, you don't want uh, this to, to uh, become a clinical condition as, self, uh, as such. Most people have this to some extent. Uh, it's very common. It's believed to affect up to 75% of the population. Some people might feel a slight nervousness at the risk of public speaking. And that's quite normal. That's, that's, quite, that's quite fine. That's, that's okay. We can face that. But for other people, they experience full-on fear and panic. And in fact, some people liken it to an experience of death, feeling like they would rather be dead than to publicly speak. And, uh, and of course, that's going to fear, interfere enormously in your future career, if, if that should be the case. Uh, but let me say that for all these conditions that I mentioned, there are treatments available if you're willing to seek help. There are ways of overcoming these problems. 
So that's example one. Let's look at our second example, which is very, very common in young people, and that's body dysmorphic disorder. And for a small number of people, that can be completely debilitating. And it can involve things such as, I've noted there, um, one might be concerned about the size of your nose uh, or the shape of your nose, whether you have acne or not, um, uh, your skin colour, your appearance. It might relate to your whether you're short or tall. One can develop a body dysmorphic disorder about anything. It can be in relation to your genitalia, whether you feel your genitalia are the right size or the right appearance. I know that sounds very personal, but you know we're all friends here and we must, we must discuss these things. These things are completely normal at some level, but when they become all consuming and start interfering with your quality of life and your pleasure of life, then that's when you're on the way to developing a diagnosable condition for which you can seek help and assistance if you are willing. Now I've put up something in front of you called a performance anxiety curve, just to illustrate how important it is that we do have anxiety. The only, the only uh, humans that don't have anxiety are those that have passed, those that are now deceased, those that are now dead. Uh, anxiety is an important part of our performance. And the graph that I've put up in front of you is something adapted from what's called the yerkes dobson law. And you can see in relation to student anxiety levels, the too little stress and you're too laid back, you're inactive. You're not motivated necessarily to do that essay or do that exam or do that, do that hard thing that's required of you as a student in your learning, in your university study, studies, for example. Then there's another level of optimal stress, and that's a bit higher, and that's, that's the level that prompts you and motivates you to do things that are difficult. It's also the level that prompts you in a sporting field to give your best performance. I mean, the opposite of this is literally being asleep, uh, being unconscious. That's the only time we don't experience some kind of anxiety. So anxiety is quite normal in our life. But then there's a tipping point where we go over into having too much stress or overload, where we have fatigue or exhaustion. That's the time you need to be aware of. That's the time that you need to take action. And I'll talk about that later too. And then there's the real danger point when you're in a situation or state of anxiety of panic, anger, where you go into the burnout, the meltdown phase, where you literally can't do anything because your anxiety levels are so high. That's the student, for example, that can't do the essay because they're just so concerned to get it absolutely perfect that they worry themselves. They worry themselves into a state of exhaustion. Or the student who can't enter the exam room because they're so fearful of not being successful. So we need to always remember to try and control our stress levels to keep them at that, at that optimal stress level when, we're, when we've got to do difficult tasks because that's the level at which we will be able to perform at our best. Now, I love this quote. Some of you might be aware of the science fiction series, Dune, many novels, uh, also a couple of films. Uh, the novels were written by a gentleman called Frank Herbert. And I love this quote because it's so accurate. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. And he's quite right that fear over time can be quite deadly. We know that fear, fear can have a physical effect. And uh, I think the analogy that I've put there that fears like cancer grow like cancer and in fact can be just as deadly. If you let fear grow in your heart and in your soul, it can ultimately kill you. It can have physical effects as well as mental effects. So fears multiply and 
can manifest themselves in many forms. And I've, I've shown you in that uh, interesting chart there, some of the fears and some of the fears that you need to recognize in yourself that maybe you don't. In this country, in Australia, for example, we know that the half the people that go to see the general practitioner doctor actually go as a result of an anxiety condition that they mistake as being something else. They mistake it as being a stomach issue. They've got headaches. They've got insomnia, rapid heartbeat. You can see that on that chart that I've given you, there are lots of things, trouble breathing, uh, sweating. Um, they're physical issues. And stress will cause physical issues as well as mental issues. It's not only those pathways, those fear pathways that become entrenched in your behaviors, your attitudes, your cognitions. It's also the damage that's done to you physically by having anxiety that comes about through this meltdown phase of, uh, of stress, where stress goes to another level of anxiety. Now, anxiety, of course, manifests itself in DSM 5 TR in eight different categories. I won't go into those eight different categories, but um, you know, we have we have names for those different categories as to how, how they manifest themselves, like general anxiety, agoraphobia, et cetera, et cetera. This is the time where you can intervene. This is what we call a point of intervention. And a point of intervention is specific places in a system where a targeted action can in effectively interrupt the functioning of that system and open the way to change. So the time is now. If you are having any of these problems, any of these issues, recognize the sign seek advice or talk about your anxiety quickly. Do not avoid the signs. Avoidance is the worst thing you can do. Acknowledge the problem, address the problem, seek some help, seek some guidance, and later I'll show you or give you some information that may help you to do that. Now, some of the difficulties in seeking help in India is, of course, this tremendous stigma around mental health just as, as there is in this country, Australia, uh, from which I'm, uh, I'm talking, from which I'm addressing you. It's a, it's a huge, huge barrier, but I believe it's probably even more of a barrier in India. I think that maybe it's more of a stigma for different reasons in, 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 in India. There's family and social pressure. Indian culture, strong emphasis, of course, on family and reputation. And that's one of the reasons for the stigma. Also the cultural norm in India, perhaps, more so than in this country, of suppressing emotions and feeling that expressing your vulnerability or emotional distress may not be, uh, may not be in accordance with your family tradition or how your community should regard you or how you want them to regard you. And so you'll be discouraged about talking about your feelings. Also reliance on family support. Um, we need to be reliant, everybody on family support is very important, but that might in fact discourage us from seeking professional help and assistance and a lack of awareness and education about some of these conditions and these illnesses and disorders and how they affect you. And of course, that's why we're having these series of uh, mental health seminars, webinars from the Mental Health Foundation to encourage you to recognize and identify these problems and do something about it. There's also belief in alternative healing practices. Um, and they might be regarded as preferable in the Indian tradition to certain Western practices. Uh, but let me encourage you. I'm certainly not speaking against uh, traditional Indian Ayurvedic medicine, yoga, or faith-based practices, but also consider the Western styles 
of mental health treatment. You must consider these also because we know scientifically that they are valid and that they do work. And of course, in India, there's the limited availability of mental health services. Um, we know that the resources in India, and in fact, in this country too, are lacking. But for example, in India, you have something like 0.75 psychiatrists per 100,000 people. Now, the desirable number is three psychiatrists per 100,000 people, which is a number that we do have in this country. So you don't have enough psychiatrists, you don't have enough psychologists, you probably don't have the same funding in India devoted to mental health. There are language and cultural barriers. Some people may feel uncomfortable discussing personal issues in a clinical setting with professionals who do not understand their cultural background or speak in their native language. And of course, in India, you have uh, many different areas and many different uh, uh, languages. So I believe having visited there a few times and having many Indian friends here in this country. And of course, the fear of being labeled or discriminated against and being seen as crazy or being seen as mad in some respect. Uh, and remember, that term madness is a very unfortunate one because most people have conditions that are quite treatable. So I think this labeling is a very unfortunate thing. So I've listed some of those uh, anxiety disorders there. I won't go into them any, any more deeply than I, than I have. One thing that I will talk about though is a panic disorder. Um, where you literally have a panic attack. And that is where a situation overwhelms you with anxiety to the extent that you sweat, you can't talk, you just literally want to bolt out of the room rather than to be in that situation or to be doing what you want to do. Uh, a panic attack is often the first sign of an anxiety disorder. And it can come, as I said, to overwhelm you because once again, your brain becomes educated in a neg negative way. And uh, if that is the case, I really recommend you to seek uh, some advice about these out of the blue panic attacks because they will overwhelm you and they will uh, separate themselves from particular situations and you might just have a panic attack walking down the street for no particular reason. It might just be triggered because that's the way that your brain is learning to behave. That's a very difficult situation and you need to resolve that as best you can. Seek help and guidance as soon as possible. So what does long-term anxiety lead to? Long-term anxiety, as I mentioned, can lead to other mental health conditions and physical conditions. And the next step, if you want to talk about it in terms of severity, although anxiety is very severe and can be totally limiting in terms of life, is depressive illness. And depressive illness is defined as feelings of sadness, tearfulness, emptiness, helplessness, and hopelessness. And I've listed some of the symptoms there, angry outbursts, irritability or frustration, loss of interest or pleasure in your normal activities, sleep disturbances, tiredness, lack of energy, reduced appetite, weight loss or increased lo uh, uh, weight, increased craving for food, anxiety, agitation, restlessness, slowed thinking, speaking, body movements, that feeling of worthlessness. So the world slows down for you and you're less able to do things that you would normally do. These are some of the symptoms of depressive illness. And this is, this is a point where you really do need, need help and assistance. Now we do measure depression using such instruments as the Bex Depression Inventory. And I've given you some of the levels there. Zero to nine indicates minimal depression. Well, mild depression, is usually characterized by anger, hopeless, 
hopelessness, feelings, fatigue, insomnia. When you go up into the more moderate depression, you have excessive worry, feelings of unworthiness, increased sensitivity. You start to isolate yourself socially. And that's about the stage that um, if you're receiving assistance, you're receiving uh, help from a psychiatrist or a qualified medical practitioner, that they will consider putting you on a medication, on an antidepressant. And I know there's a lot of fear of being put on a medication, uh, but they are effective for something like 60% of people at the first try. The second try, second medication, if the first medication has proven not to be effective, they're effective for perhaps another 60 to 70% of that, of that remaining group. And so it goes on until you find an antidepressant, and there are many, that is effective for you because we are all unique individuals, physically, biologically, and mentally. And of course, then we get to severe depression where a person can uh, lay in bed for six months, uh, can be totally socially isolated, really needs to be cared for. Um, the person is, is, uh, is completely dependent on someone, someone else for their help. And at that point, we're really talking about hospitalization. Now, depression is not the only complex mental health condition. Uh, it's certainly like the common cold of psychiatry, if I can call it that, but there are many other complex conditions and I can't go into all of them, but let me mention just three in particular. We here at the Mental Health Foundation run many support groups for people who have what's called a bipolar disorder. It used to be called manic depressive illness or manic depression. And it's a, an illness that causes unusual shifts in a person's mood, their energy levels, their activity levels and concentration. Now it can affect young people, but it's usually not diagnosed until about the age of 30 in this country. And it may be never diagnosed, but some people do have these rapid shifts in mood from extreme levels of depression and unhappiness to levels of mania where they'll do outrageous things. Uh, one lady I knew flew to London and bought 400 pairs of shoes. She didn't bring them back with her, but they came back eventually obviously at great expense to a bank account. Now that's a definition of mania. That's an extreme case, of course, but people who have fluctuations in mood to a great extent, sometimes they are diagnosed as bipolar and the medications that are available for bipolar are very effective nowadays and uh, we need to consider them if that's the case. Obsessive compulsive disorder is a very common, chronic and long lasting disorder where a person has quite uncontrollable reoccurring thoughts or obsessions. Obsessions about particular issues, particular things, particular situations that dominate their lives and cause some great unhappiness. They also have compulsions or behaviours that they're urged to repeat over and over. And some of the most common behaviours or urges for repetition are, for example, hand washing, fear of germs, bacteria, disorder. There are also issues of symmetry. They might feel very uncomfortable, for example, if a rug or a curtain or a towel is hanging in a haphazard way, not in a symmetrical way. Uh, it's quite common to be neat and tidy. That's good but obsessive compulsive disorder takes it to a new level. And of course, schizophrenia, which is a very complex mental disorder and clearly to do with the neurological functioning of the brain, as are bipolar disorder and obsessive compulsive disorder. But schizophrenia, there are many types, but primarily it's characterized by disruption in thought processes, perceptions, our emotions, our responses, our social interactions. 
And the course of schizophrenia varies greatly among individuals. Some, some people, the schizophrenia is said to burn itself out during the course of their lifetime. But for others, it can be a lifetime condition that is very severe and disabling. All of these conditions require medical, specialised psychiatric intervention. Remember, in your case, action beats agitation. The time for action, if you have any of these concerns about any concerns about these conditions, the time for action is now. Remember, no one is stopping you from lighting a lamp in a dark night. It's up to you. Now, just on a more philosophical bent and about our perceptions of the world and the way in which our, our brain functions, I mentioned that our habits become ingrained. Well, it's important to understand and to be educated about these issues. And it's some of these things have been recognised by some of our great philosophers. For example, Epictus, a Greek philosopher. It's not what happens to you, but it's how you react to it that matters. It's not what happens to you, but how you react to it that matters. Why is it that one person can face a great catastrophe or great trauma or great disaster? They can lose a limb, they can lose, lose their eyesight, they can lose their family, they, they, can, they can have untold tragedies fall upon them, but they can cope with them. They can cope with them. Maybe they've got a resilience. Maybe they've got a perception of themselves as having a capacity to, to overcome things. And we see that little, little cat that doesn't see itself as a tiny kitten, but sees itself as a strong, powerful lion. And I would encourage all of you to see yourselves as being strong, powerful lions. I think the words of the Bhava Gita, the 500,000 year old Hindu text of wisdom is very relevant. And it says, you are what you believe in. You are what you believe in. You become that which you believe you can become. You become that which you believe you can become. If you think it, if you act it, eventually it will be so it will be the case. Now remember that we've got 1.4 kilogram, kilograms of brain that interpret the world. We're not in control, really. Our brains are in control. Our brains construct reality. They construct the world around us in all its richness, all its detail, all its color, all the sound and content, its excitement, it's all created by our neurons, according to Professor Lars Muckley from the School of Psychology and Neuroscience, University of Glasgow, renowned expert in this area. This 1.4 kilogram of brain interprets the world. The world goes on independently, but we see things through the context of this organ, this remarkable organ of 100 billion neurons in our, in our skulls. And of course, sometimes it plays tricks on us in all sorts of ways. Reality is very malleable. We can be confused easily. We can be confused to our own harm and detriment. For example, look at these two gentlemen, they're arguing. Are there three rods or are there four? It's very confusing. Depends which side you're on. Your brain is playing a trick on you now. This is an example of confused perception. And a mental illness is literally the same. It is exa an example of confused perception. Look at this elephant. How many legs does this elephant really have? You tell me. I think it's quite interesting. I don't know. I'll leave it up to you. We can do things to help our brain physically function better than it does. And these things are quite obvious. 
I think they're quite obvious anyway. Many of them are the same things that you would do for your physical health, to exercise regularly, to keep yourself hydrated, to sleep properly, to connect with people socially, to have a good diet, to breathe deeply. And of course, the lessons of yoga are very important in this regard. Little by little, through patience and repeated effort, you can control your mind. Overcome those negative pathways in your brain. Develop those positive pathways in your brain. Chemically, we know this is the case, that you can do it. Now, if you're having difficulties, as I said earlier on, I would mention some avenues for assistance. And in my research, and you'll be better placed, of course, in India to do your own research, I've found that there are 10 very good non-government organisations tackling mental health issues. And I've listed some of them here. One of them, the Banyan Foundation, is available in Chennai, and I would suggest that you reach out to them. Some of these organisations are available in particular regions of India and deal with particular conditions, but they are there and they are established to assist you in your journey towards mental health or improving your mental health. And even if you don't have a mental health problem, let me suggest that you become involved, perhaps, or consider becoming involved with one of them as a volunteer, as we have many volunteers at the Mental Health Foundation Australia here, helping us to improve the mental health of people. Also, you have public services in Chennai, such as psychiatric hospitals and clinics. You have private psychiatrists and psychologists. As I said, not enough of them, but you do have them. You have government mental health centres. You have, through your university at MGR in Chennai, I am sure you will have counselling centres and there'll be people that you can reach out to for support if you have some of these issues or concerns. And I've mentioned the NGOs and support groups. And of course, there's online counselling services, such as we offer here at the Mental Health Foundation. And I suppose you can access those from India if you wish. There are helplines. There are hospitals with mental health departments. And of course, your local medical practitioner or doctor in Chennai might be able to assist you and is often your first port of call. So get involved, whether it be supporting us, the Mental Health Foundation from India, we'd encourage you to do that certainly, or get involved in any way that you can, in any capacity that you can, whether you need it or whether it's part of your benevolence of spirit that you're donating to someone who's in trouble in India, who needs to talk about their health and their condition. Sometimes just talking to a friend might be enough to put their feet on the path to recovery and happiness. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. I hope it's been of some value and assistance to you. Don't forget that the Mental Health Foundation Australia is here to help you at any time in any way that we can. And in that regard, let me say that we'll be having another wonderful speaker, Professor Greg Murray, Professor of Psychology from Swinburne University here in Australia, Melbourne, Australia. And that, that will be a free webinar, of course, as this one was, on Friday the 11th of August, and that will be between two and three o'clock. And he will be dealing with adolescent sleep and mental health, and how tremendously important that is to your well-being. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope this has been of some benefit to you.